Thank you everyone for joining us today in this uh, webinar uh, by the Center for the United States and Mexico at Rice University's Baker Institute. I am Tony Payan, the director of the center uh, in uh, the University of Rice located in Houston, Texas, as you, as you know, and I welcome you to this uh, conversation of the many conversations we've had over the last uh, uh, few months uh, that we've been confined uh, to our home. So I thank you for joining us and, and giving us uh, your time. Before I, I begin this seminar uh, and uh, pass on the microphone to our speakers, let me thank our partner for this webinar today, Control Risks, and of course, Daniel Linkser, uh, who is in Mexico City uh, and uh, with whom we've had a very long relationship uh, already. Uh, Control Risks is one of our uh, major partners at the uh, Center for the United States in Mexico. Um, uh, as you know, uh, Mexico has been going through what I call a triple crisis. Uh, the first is, of course, a public health crisis, which is um, occasioned by the coronavirus pandemic, which began earlier uh, this year and is currently ravaging uh, many places in Mexico and uh, uh, creating much pain and suffering and, of course, uh, death uh, throughout the country. Uh, the second crisis is an economic and fiscal crisis, which uh, as you know, um, is affecting all of us globally, but certainly in Mexico, uh, the economic activity has actually slowed down quite a bit and Mexico now is experiencing a very serious uh, economic and, uh, uh, and fiscal crisis as well. And the third crisis is a crisis of governance. And uh, I think the crisis of governance has two parts to it. One is of course, uh, crime, uh, violence, uh, and the general weak, uh, weakness of the rule of law in Mexico. That's going to be one of the issues discussed by our panelists today. And the second component of this uh, crisis of governance is, of course, uh, the um, uh, political turmoil that Mexico has been experiencing uh, lately, uh, partly uh, uh, because of um, the inability of the government to tackle these crises and partly because of the polarizing political environment that the country has um, uh, uh, undergone for the last uh, few months. Uh, some of those causes, of course, are unforeseen, uh, like the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, a year ago, nobody knew that this was going to hit us all. Uh, and some of them are provoked, uh, clearly caused, uh, by the lack of effective leadership in addressing many of these issues, and of course, the political games that never end. Uh, the, these crises uh, are affecting uh, the regulatory and the business environment in Mexico. Uh, they're affecting decisions by investors and companies. And so we intend to address some of these uh, important issues today uh, that I think uh, will contain nuggets, pieces of information that will be useful in your decision making as you think about Mexico and as you think about the binational relationship and of course the trading uh, relationship between the two countries. Uh, so for that, we have invited a stellar panel today, people who have a deep, deep insight into what is going on in Mexico. All of them will speak for about eight, nine minutes each, and then we will engage in conversation. At the bottom center of your screen is a feature uh, titled Q&A. So please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A feature, and I will gather them at the end of the remarks by our panelists and I will uh, certainly ask these uh, questions of them. So without much more ado, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, Juan Alberto Leoto, who's in Mexico City with BlackRock. I think Juan Alberto has some really interesting insights uh, to share with us today. And then he'll introduce the next panelists and so on until we get to the Q&A question. Uh, uh, so thank you for joining us for the next 60, 65 minutes. Uh, I appreciate the time. And now let me uh, pass the microphone on to Juan Alberto Leoto of BlackRock. Thank you. Juan Alberto, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And good morning, everybody. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I also want to thank uh, uh, the, you know, the Baker Institute and Rice University um, for this invitation. Uh, so thinking about the, the environment in which we are evolving today in the business climate in Mexico, I'd say that it is indeed characterized by this crisis that Tony alluded to. The, there, is, there is a Mexican political crisis. There is certainly a health crisis. Uh, I would also add that there is, and Mexico does not evolve itself in a vacuum, a global geopolitical crisis. And all of these 
will come to play into shaping the environment in Mexico. Um, in a nutshell, what I would say is that the challenges as we head into the USMCA era are ones of extreme volatility in the near term, but with likely few winners in the medium term, uh, determined by those who are um, betting on the right, on seeing, identifying the fundamentals uh, um, and, and making the right bets into, into the economy. And so let me start by sharing just a, a few scary numbers. Uh, um, GDP is down uh, for the first quarter by you know, 2.4% and is expected to drop by 10% uh, year on year. Uh, investment is down 22.7% uh, uh, um, uh, of GDP in Q3 of 2018 to 19.6% in Q1 of 2020. Uh, uh, with private investment decreasing almost 10% year on year during the first trimester. And so, so these are indeed scary numbers that point to the impact of this crisis. Uh, but, but we should maybe spend just a, a, a minute or two on each of these, looking at them of how they look in the short term, but also assessing how they may shape the environment in the longer term and thinking about the fundamentals. Um, so take the Mexican political crisis. We do have a new administration. Uh, that seems to be sending very mixed messages towards investment, uh, the cancellation of the Mexico City airport, the restructuring of the gas pipelines, certainly the recent attack on renewables. Uh, I think all are examples uh, of that point in a direction of uh, um, uncertain public policy as regards regulatory environment for investing and for business development. Uh, but one might also take a look at that environment in, in a more longer term and fundamental context, uh, one in which Mexico before this crisis uh, and before USMCA had a strong balance sheet as a country. It had a growing government tech take uh, in terms of tax collections. It had very importantly uh, a competitive labor pool that uh, is on par with almost any country in the world. Um, and it certainly has an installed manufacturing base so that USMCA doesn't necessarily imply a fundamental reshaping of the economy. And so uh, you see that there are strong forces driving towards equilibrium. The airport bonds traded back to par, the gas pipelines disputes were settled, uh, the renewables are being addressed in the courts. Uh, and so, so there are strong and fundamental forces that shape these public policy uh, erratic behaviors towards a more long-term equilibrium. Um, second is the health crisis, and, and obviously nobody could foresee COVID. And unlike, or, or rather like other emerging markets, uh, Mexico will face a deeper contraction in its economy, a slower recovery, because it has a weaker health system to start with. Uh, it has a, a vast uh, Prevalence, prevalence of underlying conditions like obesity and diabetes, uh, and it certainly has relatively limited fiscal space to attack the crisis. But on the other hand, uh, I would also say that we have not only the benefit of a delayed onset of the health crisis vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, but also a young population, uh, certainly a low ramp-up cost to our economy because it's a double-edged sword. So the informal economy makes it hard to provide stimulus uh, uh, for, for people uh, in terms of direct handouts, but at the same time, restarting a taco truck uh, basically doesn't require that much capital. And, and so, uh, um, so that should play to our advantage in the future. Um, and then we also have, I, I'd say, a pretty well capitalized financial system. So again, we can compare and contrast the, the health crisis as it will undoubtedly unfold in the near term, creating havoc in, in terms of health and economy. Uh, uh, but the fundamental should uh, allow us to then, to then come out uh, uh, strong. Uh, uh, and then on the longer term, sort of the, on a second half of the 2020s, uh, uh, certainly hope for uh, a strong performance. Lastly, uh, as I mentioned, Mexico is not existing in a vacuum. And, and I think there is a very, uh, uh, important shift in global geopolitics taking place. 
and, and not to go too deep into the weeds here, uh, but let me focus just on the one issue at hand that affects us most, in my view, which is the US-China relationship. Uh, and the tensions I, that we're seeing today between these two countries, uh, uh, in my mind, I think signal a transition from a relationship of competition to one of rivalry. Um, and and this, this change in the relationship, I think, will play to Mexico's advantage over the medium, uh, over the medium term, because the, the China and US economies are too interlinked for this to become a full-blown Cold War, much less something worse. Uh, but Mexico has the advantage of not being directly in the line of fire uh, of this confrontation. And so we, we're certainly not uh, like, for example, places in Europe or, for example, Australia, having to choose between our political alliance and our technological alliance or our economical uh, ties. Uh, uh, I think we've made a decision long ago since uh, um, NAFTA that we would link to the US rather than, than to China. And so the onshoring phenomenon that will undoubtedly happen uh, will, in my view, be to Mexico's benefit over the medium term. Um, so uh, it's not a slam dunk uh, in terms of the medium term optimism or the medium term look through to the fundamentals of the Mexican economy. Uh, but I'd say it's Today, A, easy to mix the signal and the noise, uh, and, and it's important to try and distinguish those. Uh, B, I think it will be hard for Mexico to capture the early onshoring opportunity, but, uh, but the US will fundamentally need us to complement their manufacturing base and, and compete successfully in a world with regionalization and onshoring. Uh, and lastly, I think this will cement improvements locally in labor conditions and certainly demand for infrastructure, which will in turn uh, reignite the positive uh, feedback loops just in time for the second half of the decade. Now, uh, I the one or the couple caveats I'd say is this will not certainly unfold uh, uh, in a vacuum in, in Mexico in terms of what I've described, but I think also will unfold in a, in a context of politics and in a context of security or, or you know national security uh, and who better to talk to us about the context of uh, security and safety in mexico than daniel linsker uh, um, who's joining us uh, right now so daniel over to you uh, thank you very much juan alberto and obviously thank you to tony and the and the center for the for the invitation I like, i'm going to try and not repeat a lot of the things that you mentioned because my intervention is broadly along the same lines, and I would agree with you. Um, and hopefully I will try to avoid mentioning the pandemic uh, as a first in a webinar since probably early March. Um, so let me, let me just concentrate very quickly in the interest of time on, on the topic at hand and how the business and regulatory environment is changing in Mexico from a, from a risk perspective. And I completely agree that it is, it is very important to try being carried away by all the noise for lack of a better expression, being generated by AMLO and the fourth transformation, right? Um, so if we look past this noise, what we can see is that there are some things that are structurally changing and there are some things that on some levels are not changing and there's still plenty of business opportunities based on the, on the fundamentals that you can see out there, right? You just might have to do a different type of homework uh, as an investor. So, so what has changed or is changing in the business environment? And I, I think there's... Uh, it comes down to three key issues, uh, predictability, trustworthiness, and uh, some of the operational challenges. Um, and unfortunately, those three are going in the wrong direction for Mexico, and we think are going to continue to go in that way for the next four years. So starting with predictability, I think probably, I would say since the tequila crisis, and probably some of you would say even before that, uh, and up until AMLO took over, um, Mexico's economic and business policy making and actually the broader policy making was to a large degree predictable. Uh, I think large parts of these policy areas were controlled or overseen or managed by a well-educated technocracy. I think uh, Juan Alberto and Juan are part of that. Um, and obviously there were some political back and forth on some of these issues, but in, generally, in general terms, you could always bet that the outcomes of the process would lead to policies that made sense and were based on a certain amount of expert consensus. Now, obviously, I, as Juan Alberto was mentioning, this is a trend that is happening everywhere where experts might not be necessarily listened to, 
Uh, but I think in Mexico, it's, it's basically been highlighted by what is going on. Um, and there's an, there was another caveat to that, that there were, to some extent, certain red lines. I mean, there were some boundaries, norms of the political and policy discourse that would not be uh, crossed. And I think this is something that is, is, is changing. I think AMLO's fourth transformation has effectively ended that predictability, which is adding uncertainty. And this is obviously something that investors and markets really dislike. Um, and, and it is important to mention that this uncertainty, I think, is being driven by two different dynamics. One is the, the direction that the government is going in terms of the broader policy making, which I have to say, apart from the ratification of the USMCA, that we need to acknowledge that AMLO stuck with it and kept on going, um, is broadly seen as anti-business or hostile to businesses. Even, for example, the, yesterday, the, the proposed changes to the pension scheme uh, probably the first time that there was a, some sort of reach out to businesses and some coordination with businesses. But apart from that, it's seen broadly anti-business. Um, and you can put a whole list of initiatives uh, like the bidding rounds on new oil and gas blogs, uh, changes to so like the seizure and forfeiture of assets, criminal pen penalties for alleged tax evasion. I mean, the, the list is very long of the things that you can, you can put in there. Uh, but I think... And obviously, if you add the political stuff and the tax on media and civil society, you realize that this it's a different direction the, the, the government is going. And the, the second driver of, of this uncertainty and the erosion of predictability is the, the something that we must take into account is the, so like the sudden and excessive destruction of state capabilities that Mexico has experienced. Um, I think if you look at the, so like the, the results of the Republican austerity that AMLO introduced, uh, the ideological differences with some of these technocrats, some of the measures introduced to, for example, prevent people from the public service, service to go into the private sector for a couple of years, um, has in effect created a system where a lot of the people that were in the, in effect, charged with managing the, the, the state have been replaced by unexperienced and more often than not unqualified individuals. Uh, and that has actually dented the, the government's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think uh, uh, a lot of people in Mexico are experienced this and businesses are part of that. Simple things, simple processes, whether permits, licenses, stock standard certificates are suddenly taking much longer than usual. Decisions are not being made. Um, uh, this, is, this is actually the day-to-day -day running of the state. And this is something that unfortunately will probably last for as long as, as the fourth transformation or AMLO is in power. And it's not something that is easy to replace. You can even look at the, at, for example, the, the government's ability to strike uh, trade deals, even if you wanted to, uh, that sort of like uh, that team that actually worked on most of the trade deals, including the USMCA for Mexico has now been uh, disbanded. Um, I think one, one interesting thing there is that this doesn't seem to bother AMLO at all. Uh, he has, to some extent, been culpable and responsible for this erosion of the capability of the state in his attempt to weaken independent regulators. Um, he seems to be keener on the optics of the administration rather than the day-to-day. -day. Uh, and obviously, every time that there's a, there's, a, there's a complaint against that, whether it's, I don't know, uh, the parents of cancer kids who are complaining that they don't have access to the, the drugs and the medicine, or people complaining that they're not getting um, coverage from the new uh, Insabi that they were receiving from the old Seguro Popular, AMLO tends to just shrug it off and say it's conservative for tax. So that's <clears throat> on the predictability front. I think a second key issue is the trustworthiness. Uh, and I think Mexico's trustworthiness as a business party partner and, a, and its respect for contracts and for the due process, especially around tender processes and the rule of law, is suddenly being brought into question. And that is something that probably Mexico has not faced consistently in the past. And again, one can point to the cancellation of the New Mexico City Airport or the renegotiation of the existing pipeline contracts or the cancellation of the Constellation brand plant in Mexicali. Um, I think the message being sent is that all of, beyond all of what the government says, that it's reaching out to government, that contracts are respected, that is not necessarily being the case. And suddenly contracts are under fire and due process is not being followed. Uh, it is easy to dismiss this as center around the, the, the energy sector uh, where AMLO has focused a lot of his efforts, but you can see it that it applies to other issues. Again, the Constellation plant 
one of them, or for example, the environmental impact assessment and the social consultation for the Tren Maya project, just to name just to name a, a, a few. Um, and even more to the heart of the of the AMLO phenomenon in 2018 and, and his so like landslide in the election to some extent, even in the issue of corruption, right? Uh, one of the factors that is helping undermine the trustworthiness of Mexico in general is the fact that this government, uh, and especially Pemex and the CFE seem to have completely forgotten years of experience and best practices around government procurement and tender process, awarding a lot of contracts directly or through close part invitation processes. And the third and final key issue in regard to the business and regulatory environment are operational challenges. So Tony mentioned in the introduction, security, uh, and it's obviously very hard to uh, mention all of them here, but I will mention two that are uh, easily associated with the business environment in Mexico and often pop up when we're talking to investors, um, uh, which are security and corruption. Uh, and I think in all fairness to AMLO, the security deterioration in Mexico predates AMLO and previous administrations also failed to effectively tackle what was going on in criminal activity. Uh, but unfortunately, I think what sets AMLO apart is basically his failure to uh, create a define a, even a simple strategy to move forward uh, and his failure to recognize the gravity and severity of the problem. I think AMLO is stuck in a misdiagnosis of what the situation is, thinking that the drug cartels these days are what they used to be in the 70s, which were mostly drug trafficking organizations interested in a low profile just to allow themselves to uh, the space to uh, uh, traffic drugs into the U.S., uh, these groups today are effectively sophisticated criminal organizations, uh, which engage not only in drug trafficking, but kidnapping, extortion, cargo theft, fuel theft, um, you name it, uh, even increasingly piracy in the Bay of Campeche. So um, if, you, if you think of, of, of this and you see what is going on with the, with the National Guard uh, and the strategy of abrazos, no balazos, um, it's actually doomed to failure. And you already see that the state has effectively abandoned large parts of rural Mexico, especially, again, remote and rural areas. Uh, and they are, for the first time, probably in Mexican history, starting to overtly, rather than covertly, uh, impose their order and control on some of these areas. And that's why you see videos like the uh, controversial video over the weekend with the Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generación um, this doing a display of force. And unfortunately, if you extend this into the next couple of years, this abandonment of certain areas, this is just probably going to uh, continue making it for a, for a worse uh, operating environment on the security front. Uh, finally, on, on these operational challenges on the corruption fr front, I think it is safe to say that little has actually changed. Um, with AMLO, there was obviously high hopes and expectations that AMLO would focus um, his efforts on uh, rooting out corruption, uh, but he's effectively replicated what a lot of his predecessors did with selective investigations of opponents and actually acquitting very close eye allies. I think one thing that, again, sets AMLO apart uh, and will probably dictate what goes on in the next couple of years is that for the first time, the, the driver of this investigation seemed to be centered around uh, the executive power uh, through the investigations being launched by Santiago Nieto and the Financial Intelligence Unit and not on the on the judiciary. And this obviously leads to accusations of politicizations. Um, I could dive deeper onto some of these issues and some of the other operational challenges that will emerge from the new USMCA. And I think Juan Alberto mentioned some of this, but uh, you'll get new labor and environmental standards. But in the interest of time, I'll, I'll wrap up by saying that obviously this sounds all very negative and depressing, but I think amidst all of this chaos and the changes that we're witnessing, there are still I think plenty of opportunities and the new USMCA is certainly going to drive some of this. It will not be the panacea that AMLO says, but it will drive some of these. I mean, some of the trends that you're seeing of nearshoring and some of these uh, fundamentals are still there. I think the, the needs that Mexico has around energy, infrastructure, commerce will all still be there. And so will uh, the key elements of Mexico's competitive advantage as a manufacturing hub for the US and Canada. This has not changed. This will probably not change. The conditions for most of the private investment as a whole has no change, even if you feel it's a tiny bit more hostile. I think the, the accommodation that we now have to do is that we were all used to a predictable Mexico in which opportunities followed a certain order 
and now we're seeing a more disorganized and chaotic Mexico, which will continue on this path. You will just need to do a slightly different type of homework with renewed focus on government policy, counterparty due diligence, and looking at the at those operational challenges uh, in a little bit more detail than you did before. And obviously, in the interest of time, I'm happy to go into more specifics, but now I will see the floor to Rodrigo. So thank you. Thanks, Daniel, for the presentation. Hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to participate in this interesting panel. I'm going to talk about the state of two political institu institutions that are essential for strengthening the rule of law and democracy in Mexico. It has been more than 20 months since President López Obrador took office. Since the beginning of his administration, some key democratic institutions have been challenged by the executive power and by Bonena majority in Congress. Despite these challenges, these institutions have still been a successful check on President López Obrador authority. The first institution that I want to talk about is the Supreme Court of Justice. As most of you know, Mexico's Supreme Court is composed of 11 justices who are appointed by the president and, ratif and ratified by the Senate for a term of 15 years. Although these justices are theoretically non-partisan, presidents tend to appoint justices that favor their ideological approach to public policy. Since his presidential campaign, Lopez Obrador showed his intentions to reform the Supreme Court of Justice claiming that justices earn outrageous salaries. During the first month of López Obrador administration, the leader of Morena in the Senate introduced a bill to expand the sides of the Supreme Court from 11 to 16 members. This proposal, proposal was a clear attempt of court packing. Fortunately for Mexico's rule of law, Morena dropped the bill and now Congress is working with the judicial branch on a comprehensive package of reforms that, do, that does not include any expansion to the court. To date, President López Obrador has appointed three of the 11 Supreme Court justices. His latest choice, Margarita Rios Farhat, replaces Eduardo Medina Mora, who did not complete his term in part because he was pressured by López Obrador to step down. Clearly, this was another form of court packing that was successful for President López Obrador administration. On December, 2021, President López Obrador will be able to fill another Supreme Court seat when Justice Franco González Salas concludes his term. Despite all these threats against the judicial branch, the new integration of the Supreme Court has acted with independence. Proof of that includes the rulings in two important cases. In the first, the Supreme Court ruled against a state constitutional amendment that permit that permit Baja California governor from Morena to extend his term from three to five years after he was elected. In the second case, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of some public servants whose wages had been cut due to the aggressive austerity policies implemented by President López Obrador. We also have to keep an eye on some interesting cases that are pending for final rulings. The first one is a complaint by the antitrust regulator, COFESE, against an attempt by the energy ministry to stop new renewable power plants. The second, the second one is the decision about the constitutionality of López Obrador public safety policies. The second institution that I want to talk about is the National Electoral in Institute, better known as INE for, it, for its acronym in Spanish. The INE is the institution that organizes and oversees the country's elections. Despite the fact that it was the INE that recognized López Obrador landslide victory on 2018, since the beginning of his administration, the president and his party have tried to capture the electoral referee. In multiple occasions, they have introduced bills trying to rewrite electoral rules and reframe the operation of Mexico's top electoral authority. For instance, they unsuccessfully tried, replace, tried to replace the current non-partisan president of the INE with an individual who is ideologically more in line with the current administration. Also, they unsuccessfully tried to eliminate the 32 state electoral institutes in favor of a centralized federal election commission. Finally, Congress successfully reduced the budget of the institution. 
Notwithstanding these attacks, the INE, with the help of civil society, has defended its independence from the ex executive branch. Yesterday was a good day for Mexico's democracy because the House of Representatives designated four commissioners through an open process where citizens and experts play a leading role in the selection of the candidates. As a consequence, now the top electoral institution is ready for the 2021 election, the biggest midterm election in its history. There will be local elections in all 32 Mexican states, including 15 governorships. Also, all seats in the House of Representatives are up for grabs. So what we can expect in topics related to rule of law and democracy in the second third of President Lopez Obrador administration? In my opinion, if next year Morena loses the majority in the House, the president will opt to issue more executive orders to implement his policies and avoid the legislative process. This will lead to an increase in litigations and the independence of the court courts will be even more important than it is today. The current health crisis could also present a danger for democracy. Elections could be canceled and some authoritarian leaders could use fear to inflict great harm to democratic institutions. Finally, it is most likely that Lopez Obrador and Morena will continue trying to weaken institutions that provide a check on his executive authority, such as they have done with the energy, regula re energy regulatory agencies. Now I will pass on the microphone to Juan Pardinas, who is the editorial director of Reforma newspaper. Juan. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share this very interesting uh, panel. Well, as, as uh, some of you might, might know, uh, López Obrador, it's like a formidable political animal. It's someone really hard to classify uh, politically. In maybe with a, uh, a bit of exaggeration, but if put it in, in the US political terms is as if you talk, took someone with the aura and the narrative of Bernie Sanders, but with the policy agenda of the Tea Party. It's really hard to classify him uh, ideologically. And uh, that makes uh, the challenge of covering from a newspaper uh, and explaining to, to our audiences what's going on, it's, it makes it much more uh, interesting. Uh, the president uh, has a morning news conference, which is kind of a, a talk show every day from Monday to Friday for two hours. And when you speak uh, for two hours every day as a head of state, uh, you create a lot of noise. And as Juan Alberto was saying before, the, the big challenge is to separate the noise that comes from this news conference to, to the real signals that will define the institutions of Mexico in, in the long uh, term. And the news, it, uh, the, the event of the Mañanera, this, uh, it's, it goes beyond like a news conference. It's like the center of government. It's the center of policy uh, decisions. Uh, just this week, there was uh, a rumor that might be confirmed in a few hours that the Minister of uh, uh, Telecommunications and Infrastructure will resign. Uh, that's what the rumor says because he was against the decision to give to the army all the management of the custom systems in, in Mexico. And he found out the decision in the news conference. So the news conference is not just a place for the president to talk. It's a, pres it's a place to, to make decisions. It's a combination between a war room uh, and a, a, a press uh, conference. Uh, so, uh, for uh, adding to, to the challenge as, as uh, a journalist in Mexico in this time, uh, we have been as a newspaper reforma, been kind of his favorite target for uh, the last 20 months. In 20 months, he has referred directly 
to uh, our newspaper more than 200 times. Just the last time he did it was a few hours ago complaining about our coverage of his effort to try to sell the presidential plane, which so far has been quite un unsuccessful. And the effort has added some costs uh, because you have to keep the plane, maintain the plane. Uh, and I think that for him, it's, it's what it's really an extremely pay painful. If, if you want to define him ideologically, he's an, an obsessive cost cutter Everything that it's costly, no matter how important it is uh, in the institutional, in the constitutional design of the country, in the functioning of the democracy of the, of, or the markets, if it costs money, he doesn't like it. And another uh, political feature of, of his vision of the world, I would say he's a Confucianism. Uh, uh, from uh, the Chinese philosopher who thought that everything on the past was better. Uh, just this past Monday, uh, one of the best open writers in the Mexican press, obviously he writes in Reforma, Jesus Silva Herzog, uh, said that uh, the, the dream of, of Lopez Obrador moving his uh, home from Los Pinos, which used to be like kind of the Mexican White House, to Palacio Nacional, which was the seat of power for, uh, for centuries, but that's like an old palace in the center of Mexico City. It was not to change residence, but just to be near the murals of that Diego Rivera painted in the 1930s. And that's kind of, of the historical narrative that, that the president has. He prefers to choose a train as an infrastructure pro, uh, a project than an uh, than an airplane than an, an airport. He doesn't have like a, a a a position on the importance of clean energy. He is going back to uh, the big energy monopolies that we had uh, since the 1940s in in Mexico, or, the, or in the case of electricity, the 1950s. He has this longing from, from the past. He has, I think, kind of a, 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 a personal uh, disagreement with modernity. He doesn't know how to do with it and he doesn't know how, how Mexico will fit on, on the modern world, on the global world. But at the same time, his 20 months in, in government, as Rodrigo was saying, has been a, a, a stress test for democratic institutions. And so far, I would say uh, we have passed uh, the test. In these key two institutions that Rodrigo mentioned, the Supreme Court and the, uh, and the electoral uh, institution, in the, the institution in charge of organizing elections. Most of the problems of uh, of the energy sector that has been created by policies trying to go back to, to the past, going to back to the, to the previous uh, economic uh, model with very uh, strong, almost monopo uh, monopolistic control of the electricity market, of the oil market by two or, uh, government companies. I think the, the strongest chance that uh, to protect a more market-friendly uh, approach, a more competitive and, and diverse ecosystem is the Supreme Court. And so far, despite that the president has appointed uh, two justices so far, I think uh, the record is positive and the Supreme Court has sent some important signals that uh, despite the overwhelming electoral success of President López Obrador and his party in 2018 and the control of almost control of the two chambers in Congress, it's not an absolute power. And there are checks and functioning checks and balances in the Mexican uh, democracy. Uh, towards the future, I think the big uh, challenge we have from the political side is not President López Obrador, it's the opposition itself. It uh, has been kind of absent. The, 
defeat in the 2018 election, it was really like an earthquake for the opposition. Someone uh, also in the pages of, of Reforma trying to explain why the president was so obs- or is so obsessed with our news coverage and why he always referred to us uh, of, of, of our journalistic work. It was an, an interesting hypothesis is that the, the president for all his political career, he always needed an enemy, someone to fight with, someone uh, to go against. He cannot see himself in a political context without an adversary. And what happened after the election is that he basically destroyed through the polls all, uh, all the, the, the potential of political opposition that he had, the, polit- the political far- uh, parties of the uh, ancient regime basically were shaken or devastated or destroyed. So the only political adversary that he found in the landscape was an independent newspaper in Mexico City, Reforma, and he aimed uh, uh, all his political energy to to fight us and to uh, obsessively comment on every news piece, every front page, as I mentioned before, 200 times in the last uh, 20 months. Uh, So what will happen for the future of the Mexican democracy? I think a lot depends on how the opposition will manage to reorganize itself and something very, very important. Uh, uh, Ian Buruma, the writer, wrote a a great book at the end of the 20th century called The Wages of Guilt. And basically, he compared how Germany and Japan deal with with its past on the Second World War. I I would recommend this book to the Mexican opposition, how they're going to deal with the past, how they're going to acknowledge their mistakes that led Mexico towards the 2018 election. And it depends a lot how these political parties manage to to solve its uh, its debts with the past and create a narrative, uh, a credible narrative that what if they want to oppose to Lopez Obrador, it's not to return to what to, to what we had before, but create a modern. A democracy where corruption needs more the exception more than the rule, and if they manage to to get the energy, the civic energy, the citizen energy of a huge sector of society that does not agree with Lopez Obrador but don't want to go uh, to the past uh, political uh, system and the traditional dealings of, of political parties. I think it's going to be a very uh, interesting election in 2021. It's uh, the the Senate it's uh, in place for six years, so this election will just go for the Chamber of Deputies. But anyway, it's going to be one of the most important elections in the history of Mexican democracy. How through the vote we create these checks and balances, but it all depends that the opposition get uh, the rack together. Sometimes people uh, tell me that uh, Reforma is, is the opposition to the Mexican president. I, and I don't, I, I really dislike the comment because we are not a political party, we are a newspaper. We have been, Reforma has uh, been publishing daily newspapers for 27 years. It has always been a critical newspaper, and that's what we're meant to be. We were not meant, meant to be an opposition. We should just shred lights to the mistakes, the, the policy shortcomings that the government makes, corruption, exposing corruption cases, but the opposition should, should do the work. And depending on that, we would see how Mexican democracy and the political system evolved through this historical stress test that it's the, the government of Lopez Obrador. Thank you very much, uh, Juan, and thank you, Rodrigo, Juan Alberto, and Daniel, for your remarks. Please uh, come come back on the, online so that we can address some of the questions that are coming in. 
Uh, I have, uh, uh, I'm going to suggest that we address some of these questions on a kind of a very quick way, sort of uh, uh, do kind of round, uh, uh, everybody can say something in a, in a sentence, two, three sentences at most, so that we can address some of these questions. And I'll start with, uh, with one, one of them that came in, and I also had it. Uh, how worrisome, uh, and I'll combine it as two questions, how worrisome is uh, the diminishment in the state capacity, the state administrative capacity due to this uh, radical austerity uh, that Mr. Lopez Obrador is implementing and now having to appeal to the military uh, to, uh, I, I guess, administer uh, the, uh, the customs uh, points, uh, ports and, and, and customs uh, entries into, into, uh, into Mexico, and of course, build the airport and help with the pandemic and so on. How do these combine? And what can we say about the state capacity? Uh, Daniel, I'll start with you because you addressed state capacity uh, uh, to, uh, to really do its, its job. Uh, and then we'll go around real quick. Yeah, so, so real quick, it, it is quite worrisome. That's, I think this is why one, one, it's one of the trends that uh, has presented the, the biggest concern to some extent because it is affecting the day-to-day -day ability, not just of doing business, but of, of everyday citizens, right? You could, the interactions between regular Mexican citizens and the government are getting more complicated, more exposed to corruption, and it's all getting uh, uh, less and less straightforward. I mean, you can go all the way from so like uh, economics ministry people having to bring their own computers um, and all of the things that that you see out there. I think the this is particularly worrisome because this is a this is something that it's very easy to destroy and it takes a long, long time to rebuild. I mean, the expertise, the knowledge that was there um, is being lost, and to some extent now. What you're seeing is precisely that that inability to 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 manage to to just do the day to day. Uh, it's it's showing. I mean, you you see even before the pandemic last year, the government was only able to execute between sixty and seventy percent of its budget for most ministries. So this is this is something that you start realizing. It has a a massive impact because no matter what your policies are, correct or incorrect, if you're not able to implement that is going to be have long lasting effects. And, and on, the, on the Navy and the Army, just a quick point, I think the, the, the problem there is AMLO has started to see the Navy and the Army as this panacea for a lot of precisely that inability of regular ministries to, to implement. Um, the problem is the Army and the Navy are becoming very much overstretched. I mean, you don't have to go very far to know that they were finding it difficult already with managing security in Mexico, I mean, obviously, it's just the, the responsibility of the police on most fronts, but um, and suddenly they're giving more and more tasks again from building airports, building roads uh, to managing ports. And I think very soon you're going to start to see a lot of the a lot of the, the creaks appear in, in their ability, having a, a massive impact. Just um, before I let others speak, one one quick issue these days when you're talking about global competitiveness, as Juan Alberto was mentioning, this is not a a vacuum, uh, their ability to clear customs and have efficient ports is something that is critical as part of the competitiveness of, of any nation. You're taking away operators that have been doing this for a long, long time. And yes, there might be issues around corruption. There might be issues about that trafficking, but suddenly you're giving the, the military uh, with a completely different mindset, the, the control over the ports that's really going to have a very direct impact on Mexico's competitiveness. And then I'll shut up there and others comment. One, uh, one can the military do it all? It, can it substitute for the lack of, for the, the decrease in state capacity? And doesn't that occasion additional corruption because then people will feel tempted to pay a bureaucrat to get their process done because the capacity itself, the institutional, the, just the material capacity of processing the day-to-day -day work of the government is simply not there? Okay. You, you cannot have a modern government, uh, modern country if you don't have a modern government, and you cannot have a modern government if you don't have a modern civil service. And I think one of the uh, lasting legacies of this government, no, no matter what's going to happen in the next years, it's uh, the debasement of the, of the civil service in Mexico. 
and uh, it's creating a an, an non-functional non institutions within, uh, within the state, within the state structure, within the administration. And what's happening with the army, it's kind of, uh, uh, when, when you, you will have someone very efficient in, in your working team, suddenly you start giving them a lot of uh, responsibilities. More um, without judging the efficiency of the army, but uh, what the, why the army? It's, for example, taking the textbooks of the Ministry of Education to the schools. What, what what's the role of the army? That, just to take one example, I'm sure Tony, you have ten additional examples. One of the in the future, then whatever I don't know who's going to be the next president of Mexico. But one of the biggest challenge is the rebuilding of the administrative capacity of the state and the government. Uh, let me uh, add a, a question there. Uh, you, uh, Juan Alberto Rodrigo, you may address this question too, but but let me add a, a, a layer of complexity uh, here because I think it's important and it's a, it's a question. Uh, the, the judiciary, too, uh, nonetheless, has become uh, what, I, what we in the United States believe is a, a, an activist judiciary. So it is still an institution that's pushing back. And I think they're also pushing back on the, uh, on the issue of uh, uh, renewables uh, as well. The, some of the amparos, some of the injunctions have actually been won by companies and, and so on. So uh, how are institutions holding up, uh, uh, Juan Alberto and then uh, Rodrigo? Um, so I, I think like we, we've said along this panel, the institutions has, have held up surprisingly well, or, or rather surprisingly more than anybody expected or than some people expected. And, and I think that's been uh, to some extent a pleasant surprise. Uh, certainly the, the judiciary, the, the INE, the fact that we you know, finished the selection of the INE board members uh, uh, yesterday by, by unanimous approval in, in, in Congress, I think all of these points to a, a more robust uh, institutional framework that, that will survive the next few years. And when one thinks about Mexico and any country, I think the right framework is to think about the short term, but also, again, about the long term. Uh, and that, I think, is, is relevant, right? So in a way, I, I like the Juan's phrase of combination of Bernie Sanders and, and the Tea Party. It, it almost made me think of, of the Reagan-esque uh, uh, view of the world, you know, like the nine most dangerous words in English language is, uh, we're for the government, we're here to help. And in, in, in that sense, reducing the scope of government uh, should then enable us to inherit paradoxically, a more competitive country uh, as, we, as we enter the new cycle and the new administration. Now, the, the challenges I do, uh, and I agree with Daniel, is rebuilding the capacity, the administrative capacity of the state will be hard. Uh, and then at the same time, the notion of inviting the military in to handle a lot of these things is not a static decision. That has and tends to have a life and take on a life of its own. That, that will be very difficult to predict. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we may find uh, ourselves dealing with uh, as, we, as we enter this longer time horizon of planning. Uh, um, you know, I, that's what I'd say. It is concerning, Rodrigo, how do you put back the military genie in the bottle? Yeah, yeah regarding your, your first question, I think the, the army is like the big winner in these 20 months. They have earned a lot of, of functions that come with great budgets. I think that's key that they are gaining more budget because they are doing more. They are also is doing the transportation of test, textbooks, as one said, mm -hmm. but also the cash of all the social programs of cash transfers that Lopez Obrador do. And, and I think that's very risky also for democracy. No, you are going to have a uh, army with great budgets and with more function that that's what is designed uh now let me let me address a question that i think is very important because we're looking at it now uh with reduced state capacity to do justice to do investigations on corruption uh to to ensure that all the processes for businesses uh go, go well and, and and they're efficient and quick in the government and so on uh, lately, we've seen uh, the extradition of Emilio Lozoya back into Mexico. 
is this uh, the cause of justice? Is this the cause of the rule of law? Or is this more uh, political theater? And we should expect more of it over the next uh, uh, few months. Uh, uh, Juan, what do you think? Well, what we had before was the political theater of absolute, almost absolute impunity. So obviously there's a political intention in this, but what it's uh, kind of, of funny, I would say, is that this uh, Lopes Obrador is, uh, he, he doesn't have a vision of, of the future in the sense that he doesn't know how the, what will happen in the country on the 2nd of October of 2024, when he leave the presidency. That's, that's not in his agenda. In reg and regarding corruption, he is debasing the institutions created to fight corruption, but the pressure that the president now takes corruption seriously, not from an institutional perspective, from a moral pr perspective, from a narrative perspective, you, you don't want to be uh, like, like, like the person portrayed in the morning show of the president as the, the corrupt of the day or the corrupt of the morning. Today, he, he mentioned one political alley that we put a couple of days ago in the front page using social programs for his political benefit. He didn't mention that it was reform, obviously, but he, he mentioned that he will not tolerate that. And uh, that kind of example, uh, I think, has been positive. The problem is that you, you cannot, a government in, institution cannot depend that you have a guy that despises corruption in the top. You need institutions, checks and balances, a professional bureaucracy that as a whole structure fights corruption. Now we just depend on the fact that President Lopez Obrador really from his guts uh, despises corruption. I'm really concerned what will happen in, if the 2nd of October of 2024, someone comes to the, uh, to the government with this weak, very weak institutional infrastructure to fight corruption, and in their guts, they don't have this uh, bias against it, no? But Alberto, guardrails are very important in a democracy. Uh, we mentioned that institutions in Mexico, the judiciary, the Federal Electoral Institute or the National Electoral Institute, uh, civil society, some, some of the media are holding so far, 20 months into this presidency. Is the USMCA yet another guardrail that will prevent that this train goes off its tracks? Your microphone may be off, so you may want to turn it on. There you go. Thank you. Uh, um, so I, I think the USMCA is a, a sort of a marginal change uh, uh, to, to NAFTA. And NAFTA, I think, has proven uh, that it has served as a mechanism that keeps Mexico on, on guardrails. And indeed, you see that the, the, the section, this is, this is the, the, the famous conversation about the two Mexicos uh, and the two Mexican economies, right? The, the, the North industrialized developed economy versus the South, where uh, as, as, you, as Mexico has pursued in the North, a closer integration with the US and it has pursued a policy of formal employment and a policy of industrialization. Uh, I think what we have seen is that has, uh, uh, produce great benefits in terms of, of guardrails and, and rule of law. Indeed, uh, for example, things like uh, inequality and social mobility are much, much better in the northern part of the country than they are in the south. Uh, and so it becomes a holistic equation in a sense that uh, uh, serves as guardrails. So it's, it's not necessarily think about guardrails in, in a vacuum, but rather guardrails as, as an ecosystem of things that, that you know, uh, provide context for the operation of, of Mexico as, as a country. Um, the, the last thing I'd say is, in Mexico, before COVID and before USMCA and, and, and before certainly the current administration, the government was small. And, and what we're now seeing is it's becoming, uh, uh, paradoxically, smaller. 
Um, and ultimately, we will need to think about rebuilding some of these capabilities in, in terms of the regulatory space and the administrative space. Uh, uh, but we, we will also see some likely some benefits, for example, reduced need for asymmetric regulation in the energy space uh, and things of the sort. Um, so, so again, thinking about the longer term and the USMCA, uh, I, I think if we put it all together, uh, it is this ecosystem of guardrails that, that should keep us on track and, and should prove resilient for, for the long term business environment. Daniel, before you address the issue of the USMCA is the gut rails, uh, uh, kind of a check and balance on what uh, López Obrador may or may not be able to do to the economy. Um, I, I sense a paradox here that I'd like you to address. And that is, he is, as Juan mentioned, a believer in, a, in the state as, an, as a motor and engine of the economy and his strengthening Pemex and, and CFE. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, at the same time, he's weakening the administrative apparatus of the state. So is he a statist, so to speak, or is he not a statist? And is Pemex really salvageable in all this? Complex yeah. question with several layers, but I think uh, it's important to understand how these things fit together. Yeah, I, I think it's a very interesting question. I think it's, it's, worth, I think it's worth remembering, or at least considering, in my view, that Lopez Obrador is a, he has a political project, but not necessarily an economic project. Uh, I mean, his obsession with energy and the CFE and Pemex are because he wants them as the cornerstones of basically the finances of, of the new generation of income from the government from which he can actually fund his, his social program. So I think if, if you want to understand in my mind that, that paradox, I think he's, he's concentrating on building his political project uh, in the long term um, and actually in terms of so like thinking ahead, his idea is creating Morena and transforming the country in his own image, if you want to get biblical uh, to some extent, but effectively uh, the, the economic side, and this is to some extent uh, going to the, to the guard rates of the, of the USMCA. I mean, he, he understands or he's not actually concerned what happens in the, in the industrial heartland, in the, in the, so like the Mexican economy of the North, the more sophisticated, economy. So I think what, what you're seeing is basically he, he has a, an old style notion, as Juan was saying, he's thinking, okay, this is, this is sort of like the 70s, right? I want to create a political program where I keep political power based on the distribution of welfare projects and the generation of well-being. Um, for that, I need income. And the income I will get, not necessarily from taxation, but mostly from uh, the state oil company. And that's why he's pumping all the resources into Pemex. Now, whether Pemex is salvable or not, I would have to say 75% it is not. Um, I mean, the amount of resources that the government would have to pump into Pemex uh, as it is now, and uh, um, the, the amount of money that the state would have to pump into Pemex to actually keep it afloat would make it an unworkable uh, enterprise. Having said that, he has the magic key. All he has to do is go back into the farm outs, go out into the private partnerships. He doesn't have to uh, go full Pemex. You can, you can restart the rounds in which Pemex actually gets funding, gets capital, manages to restructure its debt uh, with private money, right? Obviously, uh, I doubt that he will take that decision very lightly. Uh, but hey, I mean, uh, I, I guess at the end of the day, if he sees, if he reads the tea leaves, um, he might actually end up thinking, you know what? This is not giving me the money that I need. Uh, this is, I mean, you saw his sense of urgency uh, yesterday suggesting that they need to go after the fideicomisos, the trusts, where they are looking for money everywhere, right? And if the money starts running out, he might just say, hey, I need to reorganize some of this. I think we're far from that, especially not ahead of the 2021 election. But I, I think uh, it'll be very hard as they're going to, to, to save Pemex. I have one final question for all of you, but in, in asking that question, I'd like to uh, want to address one key issue about a question that came in. How is Mexico covered internationally? Uh, since you're a, uh, you probably have a lot of uh, relations in, in, in Europe and Asia and North America in terms of how Mexico is covered uh, in the media. Obviously there's a lot of emphasis on the cartels and what's going on. Uh, is this fair coverage? Is Mexico receiving the kind of attention that it needs in the international media? 
what do you think about that? And then let me add to that the final question to start wrapping it up and I'll ask everyone the same question. What are Mexico's, uh, obviously we're pessimistic about the short-term prospects, but what are Mexico's mid-term and long-term prospects as a nation, as a state, as an economy, as a country? So uh, if you can address those two things, one, and then the rest of you just address the long-term, mid-term and long-term prospects of the country, Juan. Uh, yes, I, I'm, uh, I, I admire the, the work of, of some of my colleagues from the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal here in Mexico City. But from the institutional perspective, I don't think we really, we really covered that. Uh, <clears throat> I think the, the U.S. should uh, highlight or, or the U.S. media should highlight the, the challenges of having a, a neighbor with the institutional uh, weaknesses in terms of security, in terms of, of government. Uh, it, it was funny when, when the uh, war against organized crime in Mexico started that uh, uh, 10 years ago or so. If you look at the uh, if if uh, someone from uh, an, an extraterrestrial came to read the U.S. press, he will have thought that uh, Afghanistan and Iraq were the neighbors of the U.S., not Mexico, because the, the U.S. press was so focused in the Middle East and the problems were starting to boil here and there was not uh, enough uh, attention. Uh, so I think in order to, to fo foster our partnership, to really have uh, looking in this world, uh, in a world of clusters, of competitive clusters, our partnership, I think, should go beyond and, and looking how the U.S. could help us to strengthen our judicial institution, our government institutions. And I think this partnership won't happen without the attention of the U.S. media. Sorry, and the other question, Tony, or I took it, it too long. The, the, the midterm and long-term prospects very quickly, and that'll be the wrap-up question for everyone. I think it, uh, the, the elections on June next year will define a lot and how will President Lopez Obrador will deal with the failure. I think was very interesting what uh, Daniel was saying in terms of the energy sector. I think the only way to save uh, Pemex is through the energy of the mar markets, of an open market, of private investment. And I think there's a small possibility of kind of a Nixon in China that if when the president Lopez Obrador finds that he cannot save Pemex without the force of the markets, the private investment, he will really need to have a very different policy approach from all the, nar the narrative of all his political life. But that's just one possibility in, in the landscape. Uh, Danny. Uh, just, just very quickly, I think in the in the medium and long term, um, it's a bit of a of a of a sweet and sour view. I think. I think on the on the sour side, uh, obviously, what we've talked about the erosion of state capability um, will take a long, long time to rebuild. Obviously, we we still haven't reached the bottom of the impact of the pandemic, so we don't know what is Mexico is going to look like um, by the end of the year and next year. But on the, on the positive side and, and going back to, to the opening statement and what Juan Alberto said, I think some of, the, so, some of the fundamentals are there to continue making Mexico a very attractive place. Um, there's still a lot of needs and interest, uh, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's commercial opportunities, manufacturing, agriculture, all of these sectors will, be, will still be attractive. So I think you're going to get this challenge from the from the state and the rebuilding but the attractiveness for potential investors to keep on investing in Mexico so I think a, a bit of a mixed view thank you uh, Juan Alberto again in mute um, um, so thank you thank you Tony um, I so I've been advocating and I guess this is my my own filter as an investor in infrastructure for I tend to think about the long term and, and the you know fundamentals uh, of, of investments and assets and, and and in this case in this case the country. Um, so I'd say three things. One is uh, post this administration, there is a very easy scenario where we can keep 
a significant fraction of the current narrative successfully for the country, right? So cost cutting, free trade, anti-corruption, uh, democracy, rule of law. These are things that will, will fit really, really nicely in the longer term view of, of Mexico. Um, protecting the more shorter term and the medium term, I think one of the key elements is indeed the USMCA, not only as a continuation of NAFTA, but as a treaty that is A, more modern, B, certainly a little bit more intrusive into our own economy uh, in terms of the tools that it now has uh, generated and put in the hands of, of our, the other member states. Uh, and C, in terms, I think it aligns the US more uh, structurally to the long-term interests of Mexico and vice versa. Uh, because the, again, in the geopolitical sphere, it will be more important than ever to have Mexico and the United States and Canada collaborate and building uh, uh, the future together. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, uh, about the USMCA in that, uh, in that sense. Lastly, uh, in the more immediate sense, uh, the one observation that I make is I fear that both the international press as well as the domestic, to some extent, have tended to lower the bar for the administration. Uh, in my mind, perhaps inadvertently. And so every time we go out and we say the economy is going to shrink by 14%. And every time we go out and say, you know, there's going to be this, you know, hundreds of thousands of dead people. And there's, you know, the exchange rate is going to be at 25 or 27 or 30. Uh, uh, what we're in effect doing is lowering the bar so that the current administration can go out and point to any result that is not as dramatic as, as, as it was portrayed in, in, in these alarmist voices. Uh, as a success. And, and indeed, what you have seen is the administration come out and say, you know, we only have had uh, an exchange rate of, of 24. We only have had this many deaths uh, and, and contrast that to the voices of doom. So, so what I would say is I'm very much in favor of the critical voices. I think they are indispensable, uh, um, but, but putting them in the context of protecting the narrative, protecting the institutions, and, and you know, focusing on the longer term uh, is also something desirable. Rodrigo? Uh, very quick. Uh, in the midterm, I think that there is a key player that we have to keep an eye, and it's the Attorney General Office. And I think the Lozoya case is going to be like very interesting to see if this office that since the constitutional reform of 2014 it's supposed to be independent for the, uh, from the executive power. And I think that uh, how they are managing the times, I think they are gonna use the Lozoya case only for political aims and not for combat the impunity and the corruption in the, in the country. And for the long terms, I think it's, it's gonna be really difficult to build against all the capabilities uh, but I think we are going to do it, and, and I think we are going to do a, a great job in the future. Okay, okay. We, I think we're back. Sorry. Uh, for some reason, uh, uh, I lost my connection, but thank you. Uh, well, I want to thank you, but uh, I just want to end with one uh, small observation, if I may, and that uh, has to do with the fact that before the election of June 2021 in Mexico, there is another election that is almost just as important, the November election in the United States. Elections in the United States are very relevant and very important for Mexico. If we end up with a Biden presidency, I think uh, Lopez Obrador will have lost an important rug under his feet uh, because he has been empowered by uh, President Trump's speech and approach to politics and to administration and he will have lost that backing. If Trump is reelected in the United States, I think he will feel even more empowered to push ahead with the kind of rhetoric and agenda that he's been pushing. So that we will have to keep in mind. So before we even uh, move into June of 2021, we certainly will have to be watching what happens here on November the 3rd, because that will also be an important uh, event uh, for Mexico's future. So I thank you, thank you Juan Alberto for uh, joining us today. Thank you Juan uh, Pardinas for joining us today. I know you're a very busy man, so we appreciate the hour and a quarter that you gave us today. And thank you, uh, Daniel, 
uh, for uh, your sponsorship of this particular event. And obviously this is a conversation that we'll have to continue uh, because uh, things in Mexico uh, move very fast. Uh, and finally, thank you to Rodrigo, my colleague at the Baker Institute. And thank you to the entire team uh, for uh, supporting us in this, in this webinar. Thank you all and uh, until next time.